Hey everyone, it's Jamie. Today, I'm re-releasing a very early episode of Murderish, in which I speak with Tara Newell, who survived a brutal attack by master manipulator John Meehan, aka Dirty John. Today, Tara helps other survivors of crime, and has become a good friend of mine. Her story is shocking, but it's one of triumph as well. Without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Tara Newell. For all of you who have listened to the Dirty John podcast, you are in for a real treat today. I had the opportunity to interview Tara Newell recently, and today you're going to hear our conversation. As you know, Tara and her family went through a terrifying ordeal with a complete sociopath named John Meehan, who had bad intentions from the start. Tara and her family could have never predicted what would transpire with John, and Tara is very lucky to be alive today to talk about it. I found Tara to be very open during our conversation and such a kind-hearted person. I learned some new things after talking to her, and I think you will too. I want to thank my friend Luella for connecting the two of us and for her help in making this interview with Tara possible. All right, you guys, thanks so much for letting me rant. So let's get on with the show. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy. So as you saw, I have a bunch of questions for you. If we can get to all of them, great. As you can see, I know you joined the Facebook group this morning. Everybody's really eager to hear from you. And I seriously cannot wait for this episode to come out because they just would love to hear from you. We're all huge fans of the podcast. Oh, and thank you. Yeah, of course. And as you saw, I mean, everybody's first comments were like, oh, just tell her she's a badass. I don't have any questions. She's a badass and she's a hero. Well, thank you. <laughs> of course. So I'll dive into some of my own questions first, and then we can try to get to some listener questions as well as I have some other podcaster friends who are very interested and have some questions for you as well. Okay. Cool. So I wanted to know, were there moments, I mean, even small moments where John was actually enjoyable to be around? Um, I don't say quite enjoyable, but... <laughs> He wasn't terrible. My friends came over for a taco Tuesday and we made margaritas, tried to get to know him, but he just wasn't really engaging in conversation, mm -hmm. but he was just kind of there. And that time I didn't have any feelings towards him. And it seems, I think I remember from the podcast, your sister, is your sister's name Jacqueline? Yes. It's Jacqueline, right? I think she had mentioned, you know, she kind of noticed right away that it just kind of seemed like he was scanning the room and kind of like sort of studying his surroundings. Like he had more on his mind than just being there to conversate and get to know everybody, right? Did you kind of pick up on that too or? Not at first, but okay. then I noticed that he was driving her cars and I had questions about that. Right. Yeah, that doesn't seem, I mean, obviously, if he's a doctor, you're kind of like, well, you expect him to come at least with his own car, let alone maybe, you know, a nice car of his own. And so I'm yeah. sure that was that put up a red flag for you guys. It definitely did. So in retrospect, do you believe that John would have killed you had he been successful in his attempt to kidnap you, for lack of a better term? Like, what do you think his motive was? And what do you think he would have done with you had he been successful in taking you? I believe if he did kidnap me, he would have killed me 100%. Mm -hmm. Part of being in that situation, you have the highest chances to get away from the scenario right when he tries to grab you. Mm -hmm. That's your chance to get away. And if he grabs you, then your chances just lessen. Yeah, like if he takes you, always hear like if you let them take you to the second location, your chances of being killed are much greater. Higher. Right. So smart of you to think of that. Had you watched true crime documentaries or how did you know to do that? Or was that just your instinct? You knew you just couldn't get in the car with him. It was instinct. I also was going to the Jason Aldean concert. So <laughs> part of my thought process was, oh, not today. I need to get ready for this concert. <laughs> like I need to just get away from him and go to this concert. <laughs> oh my God, that is so funny. But I think I could totally understand that because when you've been looking forward to something so long, it's like, I'm going to take care of this business right now and I'm going to make it to this concert. <laughs> yes, exactly. That is so, so awesome. 
Oh, and by the way, one of my true crime friends, um, she hosts a podcast called White Wine and, and True Crime. Her name's Carrie Martin. She's got a question for you, but she wanted me to tell you that she absolutely loved the boots you were wearing in that picture of you and your dog in the hospital. Oh, thank you. Yeah, she those was like, my oh. Work boots. <laughs> oh, they were. Yeah, she was like, those are fabulous boots. Let her know. So <laughs> thanks. Um, no problem. So my next question kind of dives a little deeper. And I don't know if this was addressed in the podcast, but I wanted to know if you have a relationship with your own father and what are his feelings and thoughts on the situation with John and what happened? I do have a relationship with my father. He lives in San Diego, mm -hmm. so an hour away from me, and he works in Long Beach. So I get together with him every once in a while. He is just happy that it's over. He's happy that I'm safe. He did have a little bit of resentment towards my mom, but mm -hmm. After seeing the Dateline episode, it helped put some closure on it for him. Right. And I can totally understand. Obviously, he's probably just so relieved that you made it because it just seems like you shouldn't have made it. Meaning like, obviously, I'm so glad that you did, but it seems like all the odds were stacked against you. I mean, John Meehan was so much bigger than you. He had ill intentions that you weren't aware of, or at least I don't think you were. And I mean, he caught you by surprise, so he should have been able to have his way with you. And it's just incredible, almost like it was just made for a movie, you know, that, that it didn't yeah. work out that way. And little old Tara, I just, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. Thank you. I believe it was part my dog, the grace of God, and then everything that I've watched, mm -hmm. like The Walking Dead, SBU, Dexter. I've just watched a lot of criminal shows and action shows. So it kind of gets wired in your brain. And that's why I say zombie kills because I watch so much Walking Dead. I would watch the episode when it airs and then I would watch it again. Then I would watch the Talking Dead and it just engraves in you how to hold a knife and to kill them in their head because that's the only way you can kill a zombie. Oh my gosh, that is insane. I just, and how crazy was it that you actually had that opportunity where he dropped the knife and you were able to pick it up and do that, the zombie kill? I mean, that's just incredible. It's like all the clouds were aligned for you that day. Yes, I agree. <laughs> And also, too, a lot of people, and, and myself included, were wondering about your sister, Jacqueline. Obviously, she had a big part to play in kind of figuring John out. And I respect her so much in her being so keen on somebody who's coming in with bad intentions with her family. She just seems so kind of insightful in that regard. And she kind of seems like a badass herself as well, because she just really wasn't taking any shit from John, right? Yeah, she's a firecracker. <laughs> I definitely got that from the podcast and I can absolutely respect that. And um, thank goodness she was because I think she helped out a lot in the grand scheme of things. We didn't hear much from her on the Dateline episode. Did, was she just not wanting to be involved in that project? She just doesn't want to be in the limelight or she doesn't want people to look her up and she kind of just wants to move forward in it in her own way. That makes perfect sense. I know it just had to be such a tornado of attention. So I can totally understand her wanting to maintain some level of privacy and kind of just live her life and get beyond this whole story. Yes. And then also your older sister, Nicole, what were her thoughts on it? It doesn't seem like she was mentioned much in the podcast. What are her feelings on this whole situation? She's happy that it ended the way it did. Unfortunately, I was involved and there's been such a healing process with that, but I wasn't harmed to the extent that I could have been and I'm alive. I'm doing well. So she's happy about that and she's happy that we don't have to live in fear of John anymore. Yeah, I can imagine. I think a lot of people, and I'm sure you've heard this so many times, had very strong feelings and curiosities about your grandmother because she was a part of the story I guess we didn't expect was, you know, unfortunately, I know that your mother lost her sister, which would have been your aunt at the hands of her husband at the time. And I know that your grandmother was very supportive of him. What are your feelings and your family's feelings on her supportiveness of that man? And kind of where does that stand today? Well, they only showed my grandma's story but she is 88 years old yeah and 
not everything's 100% clear, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And then they interviewed the prosecuting attorney. So his part of it is obviously biased. Sure. And there's just more to that story than meets the eyes. Okay. But I wasn't born then, and I don't know too much information. That's just all I've heard. And I love my grandma to death. She's an amazing person. She would give the shirt off her back to anyone in need. She's just, she's fostered many kids. She's done a lot of great things. So I love my grandma and that's all I can really say about that. And you know what? I can totally see where you're coming from, obviously. And we did, you know, as listeners of the podcast, feel that obviously your grandma is a very, seems like a non-judgmental, very caring, very open person, a very loving person. And it seems like your mom has a lot of those personality traits as well, right? It seems like she wants to see the good and she's a very caring person. And she seems like she wants to take people in and fix them. It seems that way. It seems like your mom is a lot, you know, like her own mother and and very kind hearted and wanting to take care of people. Yeah. She's very kind hearted. She's very giving, caring, just a love and nurture. Yeah, it seemed that way. Also, do you know what the status is of the man who did kill your aunt? I mean, where is he today? And did do any of your family have any contact with him? I don't really talk to them about that, to be honest, because it's this it's a subject that we just stay away from. Sure. I just know that he is out and he has a family or is married, but that's all I know. Okay. Did the prosecutor and or the police ever question you to decide whether we're going to bring charges against you for the killing of John Meehan? Obviously, I don't think that charges should have been brought and they weren't, which is correct. But just curious if they brought you in for questioning to figure out whether they would bring charges against you. I did talk to Matt Murphy after everything, actually at the live event for the LA Times Dirty John podcast. I talked to him then. That's the only time I've ever talked to him, to be honest. Oh, okay. But I was questioned over and over and over again right after the incident happened when I was in the hospital. Wow. And but by police? Yes. And were you afraid? I mean, did you think that charges could be brought against you? Not at all until my mom was like, oh, it's still an open case Uh, a few months later and then I was like why is it so open it's just it should be just shut and done there's so many people there that saw it and oh yeah it's a self-defense oh obviously I mean just and obviously I think everybody who's heard the podcast feels that way I cannot imagine even one person thinking you did anything wrong it was either you or him he attacked you and then he had very bad intentions given what we found out later he had all like basically a kill kit in his trunk I mean it's just oh yeah insane. Yeah, that's what the police called it even. Wow. Oh my gosh. So the homeless lady who was an intruder in your mom's house, do you think she was planted by John so he would have an excuse to set up security cameras to watch your mom? I think that she was a client of his somehow that got drugs from him. We also found her on the internet because my mom's had a case file on John and she actually wrote my mom a note and put it on the door of her Balboa house when she had it and said, I'm sorry that I stole your top and something else. And so we found her online and she kind of seems like she might be involved in drugs. Interesting. So she reached out to your mom afterward and left a note just kind of taking responsibility, but didn't really indicate kind of what her motives were, or if she had a connection with John. Yes. Got it. But you feel like your gut tells you somehow she and John were connected. Yes. And even when I heard that someone broke into their house, my first thought was, oh, I bet you that John's selling drugs to her. Yeah, that would make sense. I think a lot of podcast listeners, myself included, definitely feel strongly there was some connection there. I just couldn't figure it out. And my thought was maybe he just wanted an excuse to set up security cameras like, hey, look, Deborah, this weird lady came into your house. Now we've got to put up these cameras and then he can keep an eye on her. But 
who knows, but I definitely think they were connected like you do. Yeah. So with regard to the LA Times article, when this first was going to kind of go public and then the podcast obviously followed, were you guys approached by the author of the LA Times article? Like, how did you guys become aware that this thing was going to blow up or go public? And what were your feelings on it? Well, we got approached by the LA Times because Chris heard about it from the Daily Pilot. And he approached my mom first. And then he met up with her, did a few interviews. And then my mom asked me if I would want to be involved. And I said, sure, why not? It would be therapeutic. And I kind of want to tell my story so that other women get the courage to want to fight back themselves. And when they find themselves in this scenario, that they might see the red flags a little bit more than they would have. I absolutely think you've accomplished that. I mean, people will learn from this story. And like you said, even just watching all those criminal shows, you learn from that. And I definitely think that, you know, it probably was hard for you guys to kind of go public and tell the story because I'm sure people will judge in certain ways. But overall, the moral of the story is you fought back, you saved your own life. And who knows, you may have saved other people's lives as well. This guy was a horrible person. Yeah, he was. And I've actually had a lot of women contact me also, told me that they dated John and wow. that they're so thankful for what I've done because he was still harassing them. Ugh. He was just so gross the way he harassed women too. He was just like, like a devil. I mean, he just, with the things he would say were just like so disgusting. So we had talked about this in the beginning of the conversation. So I know you can't talk much about it, but I had heard there may be a movie in the works or at least in discussion. Can you say anything about that? Just keep your eyes open for something next year, possibly. Okay. That's exciting. Oh my gosh. I'm sure that's just going to blow up because people just have such interest in this story. So that's exciting. I will definitely be watching that if, if something comes out. Well, thank you. I hope it all works out. <laughs> yeah, me too. I hope it does as well. And then as far as the podcast, was it kind of the same thing? I mean, who approached you guys about the podcast? How'd that all work out? It was just the LA Times started to do this article, and then they wanted to get into kind of the new age technology. So they brought up the podcast, and I didn't really know what a podcast was. I only knew about it from church and sermons, to Mm -hmm. be honest. So I didn't think that it was going to be as big as it came out to be. Yeah, because you were probably like, podcasts, who listens to podcasts? What is that? You know, and obviously Dirty Joe was like the number one podcast for so long. And it's still in the top 10, you know, to this day. Oh, wow. I feel I didn't know it was still top 10, but it is. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. People, people cannot get enough of it. And then piggybacking on that. So do you listen to podcasts to this day? Or are you still not really a podcast listener? listened to more since I've been involved in one and I've listened to real crime profiling that's a really good one real real crime profile and I really like that it gives you just little snippets and information of how to deal with people and I listened to one and they talked about a tactical pin and I really like that yeah it's a very educational podcast definitely one of my favorites and I think you're right They focus more on the victims versus the perpetrator. And then they teach you the warning signs and how to get out of an abusive relationship and just all kinds of great things. Yes. And I like the fact that they talked about coercive control in one of them Mm -hmm. because it just gives you more information on the women who are being controlled. And a lot of people think, oh, this woman's so dumb, but these men or women are so good at manipulating others into believing in a certain way. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. It happens all the time. And it's so easy for us who've never been through it to say, oh my gosh, I would never put myself in that situation. And I would never, never, you know, those kinds of sentiments. And then here you are, you get into a relationship and they completely kind of take over your mind and and make you feel like, you know, nothing and worthless. They manipulate you. And It's a lot easier, I think, than people think to be manipulated and get into an abusive relationship. Exactly. And I'm not going to lie. I've been in one myself on and off for eight years. 
So it gave me more of a perspective of what I went through too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, you, it probably resonates, you know, with you and you're right. I mean, it can happen to anybody. I bet you just in your circle of friends, there may be women that you know about, or maybe some that you don't know about who have been abused and just don't want to talk about it. Yes, exactly. Terrible. I hope you're out of that relationship and healthy. Yes, I'm definitely out of that one. (laughs) Good. I'm so glad to hear that. I'm going to get into some listener questions if you don't mind. One of my listeners, Bryn, um, she wanted to know, how do you guys vet your mom's prospective boyfriends or do you? Now I look at them closer than ever, but she is not dating anyone and she doesn't want to date at all, to be honest. She has a dog, so (laughs) that's where (laughs) she gets her companionship from right now. In the past, to be honest, we would be very judgmental, at least my sister and I. Jacqueline and I, we were very critical of everyone in her life. I can imagine. And honestly, that's just two daughters who love their mom. It really is. And I know that obviously John Meehan tried to spin it, you know, oh, they just want you to die and they just want your money, which is the easiest thing for him to say. But that's just two daughters going, hey, we sniff out a rat and you're a bad dude, you know? So it it showed how much you guys love your mom. Yeah. (laughs) And even... The guys before John, we just were very judgmental and we're hard on her and them. <laughs> I don't think that's so. a bad thing. I think it's just, I, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. And um, they're grown men, they can take it, right? And I guess if they make it through your judgment and toughness on them, then maybe they're the right one. Okay, so, and also one of my listeners, Kaylee, she wanted to know if you had had or have any resentment toward your mom for going back to John? Um, at the time when she went back, I kind of expected it, to be honest. Because mm-hmm. even when, like I said, I've been on and off with someone for eight years a while ago, and I kept on going back to him. So right. it takes someone who's in a coercive, controlled relationship an average of six times of going back. Wow. But she only went back once, so. Yeah, and actually, I think you're right. I've heard that on the Real Crime Profile podcast. They say the statistics show that it takes, like you said, six times, if that, if they even do make it out. My listener, Tracy, she wants to know, do you have trust issues with men, especially men dating your female friends and family? I do a little bit, but then I have to remind myself, I've had trust issues before this too so I have to just remember like oh he's not texting other girls he's into me he's Mm -hmm. not like ignoring me he's actually working (laughs) so I just have to remind myself that they are doing what they're supposed to do and it's actually good to have space and boundaries in a relationship and that's healthy when someone's always there I feel like you get tired of them sometimes Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's good to kind of miss each other a little bit, right? Yes. Yeah, no, I can totally understand how you feel with that. And honestly, I think almost every girl has a little bit or a lot of it, but at least a little bit of those feelings in them. Like, hey, is my boyfriend going, you know, where he says he's going to go? And so I think that's just a natural thing, to be honest. Yeah, but now I just learned don't follow their locations, just (laughs) trust them. Because if the trust isn't there, then there's something that's going to go wrong with that relationship. It's so true. It seems like, you know, there's a reason why your instincts are not to trust this person, right? And and it just seems so exhausting to constantly be worrying about it and looking at their phone and wondering where they are. And so, yeah, I I think that's good advice. Yeah. And if they're going to cheat, you're probably going to find out Anyways. (laughs) Anyways. <laughs> yeah, I would I would say so cuz um I mean I I'm not a man hater. I I love men, but I will say, you know, sometimes you know, they don't think with their brains and um they tend to get caught pretty easily cuz they just kind of slip yeah. up on their game. So you're right. You probably would find out eventually. My listener Rhiannon wants to know in hindsight, was the dog alerting you before you actually saw John in the parking lot? Oh yeah, he was barking at the gate and I then looked at John, but I didn't know it was John. I just thought it was some homeless guy going through his car. 
because my sister saw John the night before, and he wasn't in the car that she said he was in. So I looked at the car, I looked at him, and I thought it was just some homeless guy, like, rummaging through his trunk. And I don't know why, I saw a tire arm, and I didn't think that was, like, a red flag. Wow. But because you just, I mean, you're never, the last thing you're probably going to think is that some guy's going to attack me and try to kidnap me. So I've been through kind of a stressful situation before, not at all near what you've been through. And I also ignored so many red flags and, and pushed everything off as if I was overreacting and nothing was wrong. And it turns out something was wrong, you know? So I know that's a very natural thing to do is you're not going to immediately think, oh, I'm about, I'm in danger. Well, I did think that he was going to come after me at one point, to be honest, but I was just so preoccupied by the concert that I was just like, oh, not today. (laughs) Yeah. And I could totally understand that too. You just were preoccupied. You had other things on your mind. And, and, and again, like, even if you had a premonition that he was going to come after you, you just probably never think it's like going to be that day. Yeah. It's like, Today's a happy day. Everything's going to go good. Sure. And that was actually my um, listener Summer's question. She wanted to know if you were kind of expecting him to come after you, which you, which you answered. Oh, yeah. And then I'll go to some questions from some of my podcast buddies. My friend Erica Kelly, she hosts the Southern Fried True Crime podcast. She wants to know if you still have premonitions. I guess you were having some premonitions when you were younger, and did those premonitions go away after you killed John? I haven't had any since then, to be honest. The premonition I had was actually a dream of me stabbing John. And I just, after that, I didn't know if it was like I wanted to go after him and kill him, but I would never go after someone. Right. But now I kind of know why I had that dream, I feel like personally, and I'm sorry if no one believes in God when I say this, but I believe that God kind of gave me that dream like he did to many people in the Bible, preparing them for what is to come. Wow. I mean, that's powerful. And it's so insane that you actually visualized or or had a premonition that you were going to stab him. And that's exactly what happened. So yeah, uh, how eerie is that? It is. But I just believe that God was with me that day. There's no other reason I would have survived and that he prepared me for what to what was to come. Well, you were definitely well prepared, girl. Yeah. <laughs> um, my friend Mike Brown of the Dark Poutine podcast, he wants to know, have you had any survivor guilt? And do you regret at all what happened with John? A little bit at first, but then his family, his sisters came in like a day or two after I was out of the hospital and they just like let me know, no hard feelings. They're happy that they don't have to live in fear. And then Tanya, his ex-wife, his daughters didn't have any hard feelings, but she told them, I think like a week or two later because Emily was in finals and um, she didn't want her daughter to be stressed out about it. So um, she told them after Emily's finals, and they were happy that they didn't have to live in fear. They obviously had questions that are always going to be unanswered, but we're actually pretty close, and I'm so happy that no one is sad that he's dead and that's the only thing I was worried about was is someone going to mourn over him yeah because I can imagine that would be a huge burden for you you seem like such a kind-hearted person and I mean obviously you called your mom right after it happened and your biggest concern it seemed like was like oh my gosh mom I'm sorry I may have killed your husband and it's like you had nothing to be sorry about obviously So I can imagine that would be a big burden to bear. And that actually answers one of the questions Shannon, one of my listeners had, she wanted to know if, you know, his family, his daughters, you know, had any anger towards you for what happened. I can't imagine that they would, but, you know, obviously it's still their father. So it's great to hear you guys are close and that they, they don't feel that way towards you. They feel safer, right? Oh yeah. I actually love them. Emily actually has a vlog. It's like M and Dex. And 
I was like in one of the videos of her New York trip for her blog, and she's such a great girl. Oh, that's awesome. She They seem like it. I know they were featured a little bit on the um, Dateline episode, which was kind of cool because it was like the first time that I or maybe anybody, you know, had kind of seen them. And I was very curious to see what your relationship, if any, was with them. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear that they've rallied around you and vice versa and that you guys are close. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, it's like we all were living in fear. So it's great to all come together because of this. Yeah. Cause he was terrible to their mom. I mean, obviously we heard some of the yeah. taped, you know, phone conversations. He was terrible, you know, to her. So also I have a question from sky. She's a listener of the uh, podcast and she wanted to know where you got your strength from to fight until the very end. And what was going through your mind during the attack? Well, I feel like I hated him. Yeah. <laughs> So it was hard to like hurt him. And that's like the only person I've ever wanted to hurt in my entire life. So I got strength from that. I also got strength that I'm like, oh, I got to go to this concert. So can you just like leave me alone right now? <laughs> and so I, I also know if I did not keep on stabbing at him, there was a chance that he could have got up and hurt me again. So I was just like, it's either me or him. And I even get that from The Walking Dead. Like, it's just like kill or be killed. And I think that sums it up. I mean, that's exactly the situation you were in. Once you started to fight and he wasn't as easily, you know, able to take you, he probably wanted to kill you, you know, he and- That's it's so scary. And um, do you think that his motives for wanting to kill you or harm you or take you was just basically to get back at your mom in the very worst way? Yeah, get back at her, maybe even get some ransom money out of her. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I would have been alive at all. I think he would have killed me and tried to get the ransom. And maybe lied and said you were still alive to try. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I can't even imagine. And then also I have a listener named Catherine who wants to know how your life has changed um, since the Dirty John podcast came out. Well, there's definitely a bit more people that reach out to me. Mm -hmm. And I really like it when I get women that are in these situations. I don't really like that they're in the situation, but I love that they like to come to me for opinions, what to do, and They just want advice, and I love that they want to come to me, and I just hope I give them a little bit of strength to fight back. Yeah, and I think that you you lived it. You actually did it. I mean, obviously, actions speak louder than words, and you're not somebody who's preaching this without – I mean, you you actually did it. You stood up for yourself, and everybody probably thought you were just this – quiet, kind of non-confrontational, and maybe you are, you know, that person, but when faced with danger, you definitely stepped it up and you were like, nope, it's not going to be me, not today. And I think that's so powerful. Women can definitely learn something from that. Yeah. And I also work with dogs and there's some dogs that bite you and Mm -hmm. you have to fight with them sometimes, (laughs) like not smack them, but you have to wrestle with them. So I'm like, that prepared me a little bit too. Oh my gosh. I know you're such a dog lover. I am too, as I know so many people are. Do you just have the one dog or do you have more? So I have Cash. We inherited Murphy, which is John's dog that he got with my mom. Oh. And then we have a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel that I just got in Georgia. And that's when I went and met Abby and Emily and Tanya and Augie and then Emily's boyfriend. Oh my gosh. And did you come back with a dog? Yeah. (laughs) How cute. It just just so happened that the breeder was there. So I was like, oh, this is great. (laughs) That's awesome. I know. I always tell my husband, I'm like, if we ever have acres and acres of land and I don't have to work someday, I just want to adopt a bunch of dogs and roll around in the grass with them all day. That would be my dream. Oh yeah. It's (laughs) just so much fun. (laughs) That's awesome. Oh my gosh. So Another question from one of my listeners named Barbara. She wants to know if you're dating anybody now. I am actually dating someone. He's not my boyfriend, but uh, we're just taking it slow. And 
seeing how it goes. Good. And I, I, and I think that he'll never mess with you, even if those were not his intentions or if they, if he was even thinking about it, I highly doubt he'll ever mess with a badass like you. <laughs> oh, never. He's a really nice guy. And I've actually known him since high or middle school. So, <laughs> oh, that's cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, good. And then I just, I have a few more questions from my podcast friends. Um, my friend, Melissa of the moms and murder podcast, she wants to know, oh, and actually a lot of people want to know this. Are you still in touch with the lifeguard who helped you that day? And are you guys, do you guys remain in touch? Yeah, we talk every now and then it's just like, hope you're doing well. And thank you so much for what you've done. Also, my sister, Jacqueline, she met up with her and got coffee. And then my mom met her, too. And I actually am going to surprise her with her winter formal tickets sometime in the next couple of days. Oh, that's awesome. That's nice of you. Yeah, because it's just like she was there to help me so much. And she really did calm me down. She actually has the same birthday as me really so, uh-huh and I'm just so thankful for what she's done oh my gosh I can imagine and and how crazy you guys have the same birthday I would definitely yeah. say you guys she's a little badass herself I mean gosh oh, what yeah. a brave girl yeah she she wasn't the only one there that was helping me <laughs> but she definitely stepped in and took care of me and let everyone else kind of step to the side, which I bonded with her in that moment because there was other people and they didn't know exactly what to do. And then John was on the floor. They didn't know what he did at that time. So they were trying to help him. And then so she just came to my aid, which was really nice and helpful. Oh my gosh. Thank God for her. I mean, that's, ugh, that's amazing. And like you said, I know there were other people, people there as well, but just being, being as young as she was, you kind of don't expect yeah. her to step in and, and do what she did. So that's amazing. Yes. I'm truly grateful for her. I can imagine my friends, Casey and Samantha of the true crime story time podcast wanted to know, and this is something I'd like to know too, have you, or could you ever forgive John for what he did? I don't know if forgive is the right word, mm -hmm. but to not have any anger against him, I believe I don't have anger against what he did. I don't hate him. He had a serious drug problem. I believe maybe if he did get the help that he may have needed to get, that he could have been a better person to society, but... I don't want to live with hate in my life over what he did to me. So I don't think I could ever like forgive him for say, but to not have any hate in my heart. Yes. Right. You hear so often victims or family members of victims saying, I forgive you, you know, for what you did. And I think that a lot of people just kind of come to expect that that's what you do and able to move on. But I'm a firm believer that well, obviously, John is not alive anymore, but, you know, he never asked for forgiveness in the first place. And and a lot of times these perpetrators, they're not asking for forgiveness because they're horrible, horrible people. Yet here we are giving them forgiveness. For me, I'm a lot more of a harsh person kind of, hey, you're not asking for forgiveness and I'm not giving it. I don't need to forgive you in order to be able to move on with my life. But I like your thought process as far as you know, he did something horrible. He was definitely going to harm you. And whether you choose to forgive him or not, you're just going to refuse to have that hate in your life. And you're going to just, you're going to move on knowing you. what you did was absolutely okay. I would never be in the same room. I wouldn't want him 500 feet away from me, <laughs> but no hate is good. Yes. I, oh, God. Anyone. I can totally understand that. And heck yeah, nobody would want to be near that guy. He was terrible. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you as far as, you know, during the attack, when you actually stabbed him that last time in the eye, what was going through your mind at that point? Did you have a strong feeling that he was dead or going to die from that? And how does it feel to do that to somebody? This is a little hard. Yeah. It gives me a little bit flashback when I have to think about it, but I just wailed on him 
and I don't remember exactly where I got him. I thought I was getting him in the front, but I guess I got him in the back. And I just started willing on him. I remember him gasping. Mm -hmm. And that's when he started to fall on top of me because he was on his knees trying to stab me. And when I got the knife, he was still on his knees. So I got him in the back, he gasped, fell on top. And then I just kept on doing it. And then I kept on pushing him off. But like, I didn't want his face to touch me for some reason. I think it's part of, like, the mentality of the zombie still. Mm -hmm. And just, like, if he bit me, then I'm dead. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. And that would be so creepy and personal, too. Yeah. So I just, like, I think I kept on pushing his head off of me, too. And then the last two, I actually gave thought because I was like, well, there's still a chance if I only got him in the chest that he could still get up. So I did the second to last one, like on his forehead. And then the very last one was in his eyeball. And the last one in his eyeball was actually the one that made him brain dead. And I killed him, but then they revived him. Got it. They did. They, they, yeah. they kept him alive for about four days. Is that right? Yeah, and that was actually part of my choice, too, is we wanted to keep him alive to see if we could give his organs to other people who needed them. Wow. I mean, to think that you were even thinking of helping other people in that moment instead of, gosh, I just want him gone because, you know, I can imagine I would be thinking, is he gone? I mean, if I didn't kill him, is he going to come back? Can he hurt me again? You know, who knows the feelings that you would have, but it's kind of incredible that your thought was kind of to help other people in such a tragic moment. Yeah. Well, even though he's done two great things, like made his daughters, I think that was like the best thing he's ever done with his life. I wanted him to do something else that was good and just give his organs to other people. We actually had so and lined up to take his lung, but I'm getting a little choked up here. Um, he ended up not having his organs viable to be able to give out to them. So oh. unfortunately, that person did not receive his lungs. I hope they receive someone else's lungs, though. Uh, I hope I, I, I hope so, too. But it's it's honestly, Tara, it's very incredible. And it says a lot about you as a person that you feel so deeply that out of all this, you're still trying to help other people. You know, I think it's incredible. You you seem like such a great person. Honestly, I think your mom raised, you. raised you very well. Thank you so much. Of course. Well, I will lighten the mood if that's okay with you. And I have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't need to do that to you. Oh, it's okay. So I have a little game of would you rather, and it's one question and don't worry, it's not anything crazy, but I just want to lighten the mood a little bit. So. Would you rather give up country music concerts for 10 years or would you rather have a husband who dressed as badly as John Meehan your entire marriage? I will take the dress one because I don't care what they dress like. (laughs) Yeah, it's just so funny. I was re-listening to the podcast a little bit today and the episode, I can't remember which one it was, but they were just talking about how horribly, I think your grandmother was even talking about it and he would go to functions with your mom and he just, obviously he didn't have a lot of resources. So of course he didn't really have a choice to dress nice until your mom helped him, but just sounds like his style was lacking to say the least. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I believe it's the inside that counts and not the outside. So very much. I'll take the other one. hands down. (laughs) I'm like, I'm going to chase rice on the 16th. So I'm like, I'm not going to miss that. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. No, you definitely, so do you go to a lot of music festivals each year? I try. I actually have three concerts playing right now. So I have Chase Rice, then I have Stagecoach, and then I have Jason Aldean on September 29th. Oh my gosh, that sounds like so much fun. Yeah, it's lots of fun. Did you ever consider going to, obviously, the the mass shooting in Las Vegas? Had you had any plans to go to that? I know that was a country music concert as well. Yes. Jason Uh, Aldean was the headliner. I tried to get tickets to it, but it was sold out. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad it was sold out. 
Yeah, me too. I wasn't happy at the time, but <laughs> then that happened and I was so grateful that I didn't go and experience another trauma because I can't imagine what those people went through. My heart goes out to them. Oh, that would have been insane for you to go through two crazy events like that, you know, twice in your yeah. life, though. Well, I really, really appreciate you getting on the phone with me. It's been so fun to talk to you. You honestly, you seem like such a great person and very sweet. And, um, and beyond that, I know everybody describes you as sweet and that's because you are, but you really truly are a badass Tara. And I respect the heck out of you for what you did that day. And I just think that a lot of women can be inspired by you and really learn a lot. And I'm so glad that you all chose to, you know, judgment or no judgment. I know I'm sure that you guys have heard good and bad, but hopefully mostly good because what happened, you guys could have had no control over, but you guys definitely, I think by going public with your story have helped so many people. Well, thank you. Yeah, of course. So I appreciate you coming on and do you have any, I mean, I know, is there anything that you want to promote at this point or do you want to let people know how to get a hold of you through social media or do you prefer not to do that? I mean, if they are in a situation, I honestly always love to hear their story and to give them a little pat on the back, like it's going to be okay. Like stuff may get worse before it gets better, but just have faith. And I am here for you. If you do need to talk about that, I honestly, I want to be there. I can't help financially, but I could be there to talk. That's big of you, honestly. And so not many people, you know, I think a lot of people in your situation might want to just kind of not have anything to do with that. I'm sure you're still kind of recovering from, you know, what happened to you, let alone trying to help other people in their traumatic situation. So I think that's awesome. That, that's big of you. And also lots of therapy. If you're in a trauma, been through a trauma, you need to get therapy. Yeah, I think that that's great advice. I think that the worst thing probably somebody could do is just keep it to themselves and think that, you know, they can just fix it, you know, yeah. themselves. It's, it's very difficult to do that, I think. And I think just talking to others, you know, like people like you and knowing you're not the only one who's been in the situation and there is, there can be a light at the end of the tunnel is probably very helpful for people. Thank you, Tara. I really appreciate your time and my listeners are going to be so excited to hear from you and I'll let you know. You'll be the first to know when it's going to air. Okay. Thank you. Well, I enjoyed talking to you too. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating and review and don't be shy. Tell a friend. The word of mouth is powerful. You can follow the podcast on social media, on Twitter at Murderish Pod, and on Facebook at Murderish Podcast. I have a closed group set up for us to discuss all things murderish. If you'd like to take your support for the podcast a step further, you can visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash murderish. If you choose to become a patron, you'll get some extra perks in exchange. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash murderish. Murderish merchandise is also available at two online stores. Links to the online stores are available in show notes and in the about section of the Murderish podcast Facebook group. Thank you so much for listening and for your support. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. This is The Confused Breakfast. A movie podcast creating a lot of ruckus around the world. We talk about classic movies the same way that you and your friends talk about them. With a little bit of film buff knowledge thrown in because we just can't help ourselves. If movie quotes are part of your daily vocabulary. If you like to talk about fun fan theories. If you've always wanted to punch a movie character in the face. We're here to podcast for you. From Back to the Future. Ghostbusters. The Shining and so many more. Check out The Confused Breakfast wherever you listen to podcasts.